Hello, everyone, and welcome to Super Podcast Action Committee, episode 176. Andrew Eisen here, along with E. Zachary Knight. Hello, Zachary. Hello, Andrew. How are you doing? I am exhausted because I've been doing nothing but working for the last week and a half. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Because I, yeah. I work a full-time job, and then I go to the gym and work out, I guess. And then I go home and I do my freelance stuff until it's time for bed. And I try to remember to actually take a shower and eat somewhere in there, which uh, can sometimes be uh, something that slips my mind. In fact, last yeah. night I, I was working, and uh, I think it was 11 before I had dinner, because I was like, okay, well, I have time to do one more level. And I was like, oh, no, I, I really need to stop and eat. Um in fact, it's a good thing you can't smell me through the uh, webcast because uh, <laughs> I went to the gym this morning and came home and worked straight until podcast time. I have not showered yet. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure Google is working Ooh. on a on a, on a way to broadcast smell across the internet. Yes. Yes. That. <laughs> Anyway, by the way, if you're watching on uh, my YouTube channel, uh, head over to GamePolitics.com and join in the live chat. Uh, it's a it's the chat box from my Twitch channel. So, best of luck with that. So, uh, yeah, I've been playing Lego, and um, not one of the better Lego games. Uh, it it yeah. still is chock full of the Lego charm. There's a lot I really enjoy, but uh, this must have been the C team. I'm, I'm guessing they've got about three teams over at TT Games, because some of the stuff in this game. But I ranted for it on it like 30 minutes last week. So uh, <laughs> instead, I'd like to go back to what I played a couple weeks ago, which was uh, Prince of Persia, the uh, remake, reboot, reimagining, whatever from uh, 2008 or so. Damn. And uh, yes, 13 U cube. This thing is on. Uh, so Prince of Persia, 2008. I played it. I yeah, liked it. It was um, it was interesting. It, it's got a really nice uh, painterly look. A kind of halfway between cartoon nice. and painterly. Uh, so it's got yeah. a nice visual aesthetic. Uh, nice banter between the characters. Uh, and I'm going to spoil the ending. Uh, the, the game is eight years old or something so you know tune out for the next couple of minutes if you really don't want this spoiled but um the ending goes dark um it, it's oh, one yeah. of those uh oh we release the evil god that's gonna destroy the earth so we've got to collect <laughs> the six MacGuffin thingies to seal them back into uh the tree of life and yeah. so um we do that, and you have uh, your prince, who's never named. We don't even know if he's a prince, so we, we just assume he's the prince of Persia. And uh, Elika, I think, is the, uh, the, the your companion's name. Mm -hmm. And she dies, and it's sad. And the prince says, I ain't having me none of this. So he chops down the tree of life to revive Elika, <laughs> and he picks her up in her arms, and he walks out into the distance toward the camera while the god of destruction rises up behind him and cut to credits. He just doomed the earth! <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> and I was like, you know what? I, I That's ballsy. I kind of dig that. I bet Elika <laughs> slapped him right across the face. What are you thinking, you moron? Um... The interesting thing about the game is I, I was thinking about it after I finished, and I thought, you know, I don't know why the prince is actually there. Uh, Elika doesn't really need him. Uh, in the original games, you uh, you occasionally had Farah following you around, but she couldn't wall run like you could. She, she could climb ladders and had enough upper body strength to pull herself up on a ledge, but she couldn't run along walls or do any of the weird acrobatic stuff that you do. So you'd have to run around over somewhere and make a path for her. In this game, Elika's fine. She can do everything yeah. you do, including crawling on the ceiling, which is obnoxious, but whatever. Um, <laughs> so she follows you everywhere, which kind of makes you pointless. Um, it's like... Yeah, I can see that. This could have just been 
Princess of Persia. I, I mean, it could have just been <laughs> Elika the game and had her wander around and you wouldn't have a person following you everywhere. Um, and I thought, well, it may, maybe he, he's, he's the hired gun. He has the sword. So it's like, well, yeah, but uh, she, uh, Elika is actually one of your attacks. You have a you have like a razor gauntlet that you can uh -huh. stab people with. You have a sword that you can smack people with. And you have Elika that shoots magic and does like a, a E Honda's flying headbutt at people. Um, she kicks ass in a fight. I think she could hold her own just fine. So the, the prince is oh. kind of pointless in this game. I think it would have been interesting if the, if the game focused on her. Uh, rather than the the two of them. On the other hand, the uh, she would have no one to talk to, and those two chat oh. a lot, and their dialogue is really cute uh, and fun and reveals a lot about the story. So in a way, it's kind of nice to have that second character because it gives the other one someone to talk to and uh, an excuse to actually tell <laughs> what the story is. So... I, I don't think that the game is worse off the way it is, but it just just something I was thinking about when I finished. So, uh, it, it, the, the game uh, holds your hand a little bit too much. Uh, so, some of the environmental cues about where you can, every place where you can wall run has like a worn path in the wall. Like everyone yeah. wall run wall runs there. Uh, I thought it, it was a little too on the nose, but other other than that, I, I enjoyed the game. So. Well, that's good. That's all I've been doing. So, uh, what have you been playing? Uh, the past few weeks, I've been. Uh, I I'm waiting for uh, Zaboid Games' um, Cosmic Star Heroine, and because I backed that one on Kickstarter, and it should be they're, they're, they should be done with it later this year. But I decided that uh, at the winter sale, I saw that their uh, their previous games, uh, Cthulhu Saves the World and Breath of Death Seven, were on sale. Uh, to oh 50 yes, cents Steam, the Steam told me you were playing that. That's right. Yeah, and uh, and so I I I bought them and uh, I'm playing through them now. I beat Breath of Death Seven um, on normal mode. I, I haven't bothered going through on the other modes. Um, so, but I beat it, and all that's left for me to do in that game, just like in my regular save, is to clear out the final optional dungeon. Because you can clear out uh, all the fights in in dungeons, and I think I have like a dozen or so fights left in that optional that final optional optional dungeon, and I want to clear that out, and then clear out all the the uh, battles on the world map, because uh, you can also do that. And uh, I have, um, oh, let's see, I, I I believe the game has two hundred. Uh, battles on the world map and i think i have like 160 of them because I, I haven't bothered to sit there and fight on the world map yet uh i've just been letting the random travel the world but i feel like i, I want to do that but uh and then I, now but i i'm putting that aside because I'm playing through Cthulhu Saves the World now and uh, and really enjoying it. Uh, both of these games are pretty good. Um, you know, they're they're very retro in in the in their uh, gameplay and and look. Um, not even you know, they're they're kind of a a, a crossbreed between NES and and Super NES uh, graphics wise. Wise. Uh, gameplay wise they play very much like uh, the original dragon warriors uh, you know, except you know you don't spend too much time in the menus opening doors and climbing downstairs <laughs> like you do in the original dragon warrior um, but the humor I'm I'm enjoying the humor um, yeah you know, uh, breath of death 7 yeah you know, it takes place in a in a post apocalyptic world where Basically, humanity destroyed itself, and and uh, the undead have taken over. And you you start your your main character is a skeleton warrior. You pick up a ghost, a vampire, and a zombie to complete your party. Mm. So that, that's all. That's pretty fun, and the interactions are pretty good too. Um, the the first Breath of Death Seven kind of forces a, a you know 
relationships between uh, the ghost and and the skeleton and the zombie and the and the vampire you know it's it's kind of an unrequited uh, unrequited love mm -hmm. Because like the ghost loves Dim, but Dim's just kind of, or the ghost loves the skeleton, and the skeleton's just kind of whatever, leave me alone type thing. And then, uh, and the zombie loves the vampire, and and she's just like, you creep me out, leave me alone. <laughs> so it's kind of funny, you know. It just makes fun of uh, relationships and games, but uh, and uh, Cthulhu saves the world puts a relationship between uh, Cthulhu. Thulu and the first character you pick up. Um, her name is escaping me now, but she's a, a little uh, she's a cleric or something along those lines. But yeah, it's really funny, and it, one of the things the world is just uh, they the that game really fourth wall a lot because Cthulhu is constantly arguing with the game's narrator because. Cthulhu has he loses his power at the beginning of the game, and the only way to regain his power is to become a hero. And so his goal through the game is to become a true hero so that he can destroy the world, and, and which is a excellent reason to become a true hero, I guess. And so he's constantly arguing with the the narrator when the narrator says Cthulhu has become more of a hero, but he's not a true hero yet. Um, so, but yeah, the the humor is is making me look forward to uh, um, Cosmic Star Heroine. Except uh, Cosmic Star Heroine is not going to be a satire of the RPG genre. Uh, they're they're making it as a serious RPG this time. So, you know, I'm I'm looking forward to that. I, I'm still not sold on on picking up their uh, the um, the Penny Arcade games. They they made three and four. It's just the penny art. The first two penny arcade games just did not appeal to me, mm -hmm. and so I'm just like, you know, I like these guys, but I don't really care for the penny arcade games. So I'm probably not going to pick those two up. Yeah. But um, but yeah, Cthulhu saves the world in Breath of Death Seven is definitely worth it if you guys want to want to pick that up. Uh, yeah, especially if you like RPGs. Yeah, it's it's a good satire. Um, you know, there's a lot of articles written over the last few months about Undertale and a, a handful of them compared Undertale to uh, to Zaboid Games uh, the, their RPGs but uh, they, is, uh, Robert Boyd and uh, and Bill I forget his name Bill Steinberg they, they, they don't consider their games to be along the same uh, in the same league as Undertale, they they admire Undertale and they think it's a great game, but they don't think their games are quite up there. So because their their games are pretty. Uh, you know, I want to play it, but uh, Undertale, but uh, yeah. Undertale and games that are hyped as highly as uh, or not hyped so much as universally loved as fervently <laughs> as Undertale is scare me. Because yeah. I'm afraid I'm going to be that guy who doesn't like that. <laughs> oh. Yeah, I, I know what you mean. Because yeah, you know, I, I, there's a lot of games out there that people are just like, you got to try this. And I try it and I'm like, okay, is this supposed to impress me? I'll tell you the, the one that I'm just not seeing. And to be fair, I've not played it. But The Witness. That game is doing absolutely nothing for me it looks I haven't really simple looked and boring into it at all I, um, I i i know it's out there i know it exists but it's just i i've never actually felt the need to um actually investigate it to see if i actually want to get it you know i've played braid and mm -hmm. braid is good and but i haven't completed it completed it yet but it it's 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 a fun deconstruction of the damsel in distress trope as uh, well as yeah. a, a good puzzle platformer but it's just it's not it, it didn't hold my attention through the whole thing yeah that that Especially was the problem some I of the had puzzles with were it. just kind of yeah. <laughs> uh, I got to about to the first boss, and that's where I was like, this game just isn't doing it for me. I, I admired it, and I appreciated a lot about it, but I just wasn't having fun playing it. Um, uh, a trailer, or 
Laxter's asking me, how about if it comes to Nintendo consoles? Rumors are that it might. I imagine Undertale. Uh, yeah, I'd, I'd, I mean, unless they <laughs> charge a price that I wouldn't be willing to pay for it. But yeah, I. Well, right I'd, now it's forty dollars. So forty bucks? <laughs> nope. Yeah. <laughs> Not paying forty bucks for it. Forget it. Yeah. Uh, anyway, I was talking about the witness. Um, we first saw the witness at, at E3 either last year or the year before, and um, th- it showed a, a, a island with th- that's colorful. Okay, cool. And mm-hmm. it's got puzzles. I'm like, and everything they showed was this like little maze puzzle. I'm like, okay, what else you got? And they didn't say, so I wasn't interested. And now that the game's out, I've actually looked at some uh, Let's Plays of the earlier areas in the game, and it's all maze puzzles. Which, uh, I, I find myself going, that's it? That's boring. And then mm-hmm. I think, well, you know, if you like maze puzzles, that's great. I, I, I mean, I, I enjoy Pcross, so I, I, mm-hmm. I like games that are just a bunch of Pcross puzzles. Uh, yeah. A lot of people like Sudoku, and they play a game that's just entire Sudoku puzzles, or uh, any of the match three type of uh, falling gem type of games. It's just the same damn thing over and over and over, even if you put a story around it like uh, Puzzle Quest yeah. or something like that. So, <laughs> I, you know, and to, to be fair, I have seen many variations on the theme. Uh, you have yeah. to uh, pick up the little dots in the maze. The the path you take has to pick up all the little dots in the maze. Or there are uh, black and white nodes that you have to separate with the line that Mm -hmm. you draw through the maze. But at the end of the day, you're wandering around a pretty island and drawing lines. And it's (laughs) boring the hell out of me. And every, every puzzle in the first hour and a half of the game is boneheaded simple. Um... Uh, maybe it gets really, really hard later, and I hear that it does, but I've watched the first several areas of the game, and I was looking at the thing on my monitor going there and waiting for the person playing the game to catch up with me. Uh, <laughs> maybe I'm just really, really good at maze puzzles or something like that. Maybe, it, it, maybe that's what it is, but uh, the game is doing nothing for me, but everyone seems to love it, so I'm almost like... I kind of want to play it just to see where it goes, but uh, yeah. Well, and uh, and from what I've heard, uh, you know, I, I'd have to double check this, but it's the uh, the witness has sold more copies in like the first week of sales than Braid did in its entire first year. So yeah, yeah, yeah it, it's doing really, really well. Yeah, it's doing really well, and it's making the guy a lot of money, especially at a forty dollar price tag. Um, you know he he's he's making bank on this and and it's doing well for him. I'm glad he's doing well. Oh yeah, yeah, no, I, I'm, I, yeah. I, but I'm I have nothing you. against I mean, the developer just, or anyone yeah. who's enjoying the game. It's just not connecting with me. And yeah, to be I, fair, I I've not haven't... played it, so maybe it's just something <laughs> you really have to play to. Oh, but um, I've yeah. seen what I feel is enough of the game to pretty accurately determine that it's just yeah. not for me. Uh, I, I guess I just don't like line puzzles. Um, <laughs> yeah, and and the uh, and the forty dollar price tag you know, is, is a little a bit steep high, for me. And and I'm not I'm, I'm cheap, not though. one to uh, you know to say you know you shouldn't price your games that high. You know if that's what people are willing to pay, oh, go right ahead right. and yeah. price it that way. But for me. I tend to buy games on the cheap. I buy games a year or two after they come out so that there's a good drop in price. And a lot of times I'll wait until they're on sale. Mm-hmm. Um, the vast majority of my games that I have right now, especially PC games, have come through the Humble Bundle. So I'm, I'm able to pay like $10, $15 for like a half dozen to a dozen games. And that's a good deal for me. And yeah. so uh, I, I don't expect the witness to hit the Humble Bundle for at least a year, maybe a year and a half, two years. Yeah. But, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think it's uh, a grand enough game to... Uh, Undertale looks... At, now, I've not played it, so I don't know how long or complex it is, but it looks like a game that... Like, I'd pay 10 bucks for it. 
Um, and I, I'm the kind of guy who looks at a game and judges it, <laughs> you know. And I, <laughs> I look at the witness and I go, I, I'd pay twenty bucks for it, sure. But it doesn't really look like a forty dollar game to me. But of course, I'm also the guy who will not pay forty to thirty or forty dollars for handheld games. I don't care how good yeah. it is. Uh, twenty bucks is as much as I'll pay for handheld games because I'm cheap. Um, <laughs> anyway, so let us move on to the poll topic of the week, um, right. which uh, w w which uh, requires a little bit of a backstory. So um, uh, I have it here. So there's a tattoo studio who has done the art on several NBA players, including LeBron James, Kobe Bryant, Kenyon Martin, DeAndre Jordan, and Eric Bledsoe. And the first two are the only ones I know about, only because people in Oklahoma can't seem to shut up about them. Yeah, I've heard of LeBron James <laughs> and Kobe Bryant. That's why I know how to pronounce their names. The rest of them, I don't know. Uh, couldn't even tell you what team any of them played for. But they're basketball players, that I know. Anyway, so these gentlemen all have tattoos. Uh, apparently, all of these tattoos came from a particular studio, and these tattoos are copyrighted designs. They're original designs that the uh, tattoo studio owns the copyright for. Fine so far. Uh, 2K Games uh, is using these players and others' likenesses for their basketball game, NBA 2K16. Uh, the tattoo studio uh, apparently approached 2K Games and said, you know what? For a million dollars, $1.1 million, we will license you the rights <laughs> to using our copyrighted tattoo designs on the likenesses of the players that you're putting in the game. Uh, 2K apparently told him to go suck wind, and uh, now the tattoo artists are suing 2K Games <laughs> over uh, copyright infringement. Yeah. Uh, so, Which is actually kind of fun, because uh, this is a little snippet at the bottom of uh at the bottom of the article but uh the maximum statutory damages for copyright infringement in in u.s law is a hundred and fifty thousand dollars per infringement that means for every copy of uh nba 2k16 sold or actually produced multiply that by a hundred and fifty thousand dollars and that's how much this uh tattoo parlor or artist uh, could theoretically win in a lawsuit against 2K Games. Would you also have to multiply it by five, the five different players that these tattoos appear on? Um, I, I would say possibly per tattoo per yeah, copy per of the game. tattoo. So, so if, <laughs> if, some of if uh, one of the players has like two or three tattoos from the same guy, you know, then that's that's three tattoos times each copy of the game times a hundred and fifty thousand dollars so you know it, it's it that, that would be something that the courts would have to sort out but uh but yeah but that's just the ridiculousness of copyright law statutory damages right now so uh <laughs> i just thought i wanted i i just thought i would throw that out there because that's what 2k games is facing when it comes to this uh potential lawsuit <laughs> All right, but carry on. <laughs> says, but what if it's a handheld remake of a console game? Well, that's if it's a handheld remake. That's incredibly it's, uh, unappealing. One, it's a handheld game. Two, it's a remake. So I've probably already played it, so I don't want to play it again. And why would I get the inferior version? And yes, if it's on the handheld, it's the inferior version. Anyway, um, <laughs> so I think he's kind of you know, pointing, you know, like a. Uh, um, 3D Ocarina of Time 3DS version. Yeah, yeah I, that's, didn't, uh, I didn't get it because I have a, actually like three different copies of Ocarina of Time on my shelf over here. I have the original for the N64, which is actually in a drawer that way, sorry. Uh, but I also have the Master Quest thing that came with on the GameCube for something, and then I have another, it's yeah. in a, in, in a co collection of them for some anniversary thing or whatever. Uh, yeah. I already played Ocarina of Time. It's a great game. I already played it. No need to get a remake and certainly wouldn't play it on a handheld. Same thing with Majora's Mask. Love that game. Falls apart towards the end, <laughs> but uh, not playing a remake. Certainly not playing it on the handheld. Wind Waker. I, I have it on the GameCube. I, uh, Twilight Princess HD. I have it on the GameCube. I have no interest in buying it on the Wii U because... Uh, yeah. 
now the Resident Evil remake, if you're remaking it to that extent, to the point where it's like actually a new game, like the Final Fantasy VII remake, yeah, okay. But if you're just making the graphics a little prettier and maybe tightening up some of the gameplay, tweaking things here and there, adding, adding a Swift sale thing. If they actually added new areas to the game, I might I might double dip. I actually yeah. double dipped on Resident Evil 4 for the Wii. Uh the presentation was a lot better, but it also added all of Ada Wong's side missions, which was a <laughs> fairly beefy amount of content. Uh, also one of my favorite games of all time. So, anyway. Um, uh, but Back the majority the mask remake took longer to develop than the original did. Uh, that doesn't mean anything. I don't care. <laughs> there have been some absolutely terrible games that were in development for for multiple years. Uh, Duke Nukem Keep Forever Duke. is uh, is is the epitome of terrible game yeah. that took forever to make. So, <laughs> but um, it does the Majora's Mask remake look better than the N sixty four? Yeah. But I, I personally would still call it the inferior version simply because it's on the handheld and it is absolutely not where I want to play a Zelda game. Yeah. I want to play it on my TV. It's kind of yeah, like Monster but you also Monster. can't really Monster, judge. I do not want to play it on the handheld. Yeah, but you can't really judge uh, Majora's Mask like what it took to make each copy because the original Majora's Mask uh, was built using the Ocarina of Time engine, and mm -hmm. so so they and had they so had a lot of that pack. work already done. But with Majora Mask Remake, they didn't reuse the. Uh, as far as I know, they didn't reuse the uh, the the Ocarina of Time engine. Hmm. They, they, I, I, that's that's what I understand. But yeah, that that would well, be why it took longer. Anyway, got got sidetracked Back there. The so uh, <laughs> so the question this week is: Should the tattoo artist be paid when a person inked with their copyrighted design appears in a movie or game? Yes or no? One hundred thirteen people voted. Uh, Eighty six people said no. Twenty seven people said yes. So most people think that the uh, the tattoo artist is not entitled to monies when there's a public when a person goes. It's an interesting thought, right? I, I mean, yeah. is someone's copyrighted design become part of my likeness when it's tattooed on my butt? You know, do every every time I take a picture of my butt. And uh, their video of my, when I do my next video, Andrew twerks to the oldies, and um, <laughs> video of my tattooed arse bouncing around on the screen, and I monetize it. Is the tattoo artist going to have a claim on that? <laughs> these are these are the, and that's that's what goes <laughs> in front of the court. Now watch this video, <laughs> Your Honor. Boinky, 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 boinky. Oh so, man, yeah, um, see, it, this is actually a good question, and this is a, a an area of copyright law that has yet been settled in court, and it's completely unclear the whether uh, just looking at copyright law what the intent of Congress is in this area. Yeah, um, because basically, copyright law is if if you create something and you put it into a fixed medium, it becomes your copyright. You know, you have a copyright on that. You know, it's like, you know, if you draw a picture on a piece of paper, you know, that that drawing is copyrighted. And only you have the right to make copies of that and distribute them. Um, and so, but, but tattoos are a very different thing um, because you take your tattoo, you take the copyright on, or take the tattoo and you put it on a living person's skin and you may have the copyright on that but you have no rights over that person right. you know that person has your copyrighted image on on their skin but as far as I can tell as far as I'm concerned the copyright holder does not have the right to prevent that person from doing what normal people do such as take pictures of themselves or have pictures of them taken um create videos with them in the, in it and sell their likeness to video game developers mm -hmm. uh, that seems like an area where where the uh your publicity rights overrules the copyrights on 
a tattoo you actually have. That's my personal opinion. I I would think so, yeah. But uh, as far as I know, uh, every single instance of this type of case has been settled out of court. I think probably yeah, the yeah. most notable example would be uh, The Hangover 2. One of the characters mm. gets the... Uh, Facial Mike Tyson that tattoo. Mike Tyson has, and the tattoo artist sued whatever company did uh, the Hangover, and um, saying that that is my copyrighted design. You can now it wasn't Mike Tyson in the movie; it was that copyrighted design being put on another person who was yeah, not because Mike, Mike Tyson, Tyson was in the first Hangover, and oh, the guy you? didn't have no. any problem with right. uh, with Mike Tyson being in that with his tattoo on it right. because that's Mike Tyson. Yeah. But yeah, but they but uh, the the movie studios uh, took that design and put it on the main character's face, yeah. and so and technically they were making a copy right. of so, the copyright. So um, the, uh, that was settled out of court. Yes, it was, and uh, and that, as far as I know, that's the only real high-profile case. Um, I, I was mm -hmm. trying to trying to see if there were any other cases like this, but I couldn't recall any, and so I was just like, okay, I can't think of any other any other way to search this. So it's like, okay, we've got two K games, and we have the Hangover Two. So <laughs> this is our case law here. Um, <laughs> Lex I did out happen that, this, that the, uh, the Hangover Two is a little different. It, it absolutely yes, is, it is different it is. Yeah. because this is uh, a reproduction of a piece of copyrighted uh, copyrighted yeah. work. Uh, in the video game, what they're asking is, do we have to license the a person's likeness and their body art? Or yeah. if I license oh, you know what? Like this, now that I think cool. about it, there was another similar case having to do with um, uh, Ultimate Fighting, uh, Ultimate Fighting video game, where somebody oh. had tattoos and and uh, and that. And I, I think that one was also settled out of court mm -hmm. because you know who wants to face one hundred and fifty thousand dollars times the number of video games sold mm -hmm. um, when they could just pay you know. Three hundred thousand dollars just to get this guy Go to away. leave me alone. Yeah, um, but this is the kind of thing that that you, as a, a or a, as someone who follows copyright law and intellectual property law, this is the kind of thing that I want to see to go to court. I want to see what judges will actually rule in these kind of cases, because this is just, this is a conflict between two areas of law that Congress has not addressed. And until we have enough, um, enough public attention, enough uh, judicial uh, rulings one way or another, Congress has no incentive to address this conflict of law. Yeah. And, uh, and so this is the kind of stuff that, yeah, I want to see this go to court. I want to see people writing their legislators saying, hey, I don't want my tattoo artist to tell me I can't have pictures of myself taken. Yeah, you know, yeah. I, I, you know, th that, that's, that's it. And um, I actually did some reading up on this, and, and, uh, and, basically every, every law professor that or lawyer who's written on this subject has basically come to the conclu same conclusion as I do. It's like you know, you have two conflicting areas of law, and one should not supersede the other. But we have no, we have no uh, legal. We have no legal pre precedent here, and we have no uh, congressional uh, consensus on this. So it's like, until one of those things change, you know, <laughs> we're just kind of, you know, stuck up the creek without a paddle. Yeah. <laughs> hmm. So, uh, all right, l let us move on to a new topic, and uh, this is one I wanted to talk about because it was a little weird. So uh, apparently there was a special edition of, or a, rather a collector's edition of Bethesda's Fallout 4 that included a four uh, LP set, uh, four disc uh, vinyl set of uh, Fallout 4 music. And a gentleman by the name of Paul Watson ordered the uh, collector's edition and was very, very sad to see that uh, one of the uh, vinyl records was warped and unplayable. Uh, so he spent a month, uh, apparently, speaking with uh, uh, Bethesda customer service, saying that uh, I, I would like a refund, please, because uh, warp. Uh, 
and he sent a picture showing proof that the record yeah. was indeed warped, warped, and uh, they sent him uh, twenty five bucks, and he said, "You should that that appears to be a fourth of the price. You should send you should refund me the entire price because this is a four LP set. They're not." sold individually so i i can't just rebuy disc one the whole yeah. so the whole thing is i i want my money back for the whole thing so bethesda and if twitter is to be believed um <laughs> said um uh hello paul you only showed that one of the records was damaged so we refunded you for that damaged record if the other records are similarly affected please provide photos here's the good part however if they are not affected and you still would like a full refund for the product please follow the instructions below for this limited edition item step one destroy the other records Step two, provide photos of the damaged records. Once I get those photos, I will happily refund you for your order. Thank you and have a wonderful day. <laughs> Here's the even weirder part, depending on you. He actually did it. He busted the other three records to... I, yeah, there's a picture of him holding a, a, you know, a hammer. A, a hammer. Four busted records. And, um, now... <laughs> <laughs> you do you, dude, but were it me, I would have taken the 25 bucks and at least still had three playable records. I mean, yeah, yeah, you're still missing the first record, but now you have zero, and you still can't buy a full set because they don't exist. Um, unless you found them on eBay and that maybe he and found probably, the whole thing on eBay for a hundred bucks and that's why he wanted it refunded because he already bought a replacement on eBay or, or something like that. Um, but man, if, if I couldn't get a replacement, I, I'd say, well, I mean, at least I got three out of four. I, what do you think? Do you think the initial refunding the cost of one of the records was fair or do you think um, one broken record out of the four should refund the entire cost? <clears throat> yeah, that's a uh, that, that is a good question because you know if it's a full set, you know you, you would think that uh, you know the full set should be complete mm -hmm. in, in order for your money to be spent uh, properly. Yep. And since uh, you know since one of your records is damaged you know i i would say yeah i you know you i could see you know asking for a full refund and expecting it now it'd be kind of like buying a loaf of bread getting it home and finding out that a quarter of your loaf has mold on it you know you don't take it back to the store and get a quarter of your refund of the loaf of bread you get a whole mm -hmm. new loaf of bread right but that's food you know cuz the the but so that's very different than uh, you know buying this and or buying something like this and it's different from say like buying a video game that comes on multiple discs and having mm -hmm. one of the discs damaged right. because at then that point the entire the game. game becomes yeah. unplayable i mean you can play um, well, you can play well depending on which disc it is. Yeah, you know, if it's you disc one, you're it. probably SOL. Yeah, but these are music LPs, from what I understand. Yeah, so even though LPs, he's missing so. the the first one, he can still play the yeah, music he can still that's on two, three, and four on the other three, and and so yeah, I, you know, in this case, since there are they're basically separate components of mm -hmm. one larger whole. I could see getting a refund on only that one. That Unless was it's one really fair. long song that's that, that exists over four different. That's a long song <laughs> that, that just runs over four LPs. Uh, yeah, I don't I think don't they think do so, that because that's <laughs> that that seems to be a little untenable. Because that'd be really you know, it's like, I'm listening to a song, song and then I have to change records. <laughs> yeah, well, it's like Laserdisc, where it's like halfway through the movie, you have yeah. to take the Laserdisc out, flip it, and put it back in to continue watching your movie. Yeah, yeah that's really annoying. <laughs> yeah. Um, but but yeah, I, but the the um. I don't know. It, it, it seems like a really weird request, though, to ask somebody to destroy an entire collection in yeah. order to get the full refund. That that's I the mean, weird. If the weirdest said, okay, part. If you me. send if you send it back to us, we'll ref refund it rather than hit it with a hammer. 
It's yeah. like, wow, really? Well, I think, but even <laughs> then, you know, but uh, again, you know, I think that uh, sending it back, you know, it, Bethesda really has no interest in receiving the full thing or the, the records back because they can't resell it. Yeah, because it's an incomplete set. You know, maybe they could collect multiple returns and and then put together some actual complete sets yeah. to sell as a uh, you know a second run or something. Yeah, yeah. You, you but, think they uh, request? Okay, if you want a full refund, then send the, send it back to us. And then yeah. he might go, "Oh, you want it back? Wham, wham, wham! Here you go." <laughs> Oh, oh, it came in pieces. Yeah. That's so sad. That must must be UPS. Um, so I mean, anyway, that was just probably the yeah. weird story of the week. I, I was, yeah, that was a weird story, and and uh, it's a shame that we didn't get more comments on that. Yeah. But uh. but uh, anyway, moving on. Uh, censorship. So let us talk Woo-hoo. about Nintendo and uh, I go Fire praises. Emblem Face. Yeah. Hmm? Oh, I said woohoo, and I said there I go praising censorship again. <laughs> yeah, the, 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 I, I I did just say uh, censorship with an exclamation point, a few of them, all caps. So uh, some might interpret that as uh, censorship. Hell's yeah, that's not exactly what that was intended to apply, but uh, that's okay. So anyway, uh, Fire Emblem Fates uh, comes out sometime this month. And uh, yeah. there are a few changes that are being made to the localized version of the game. Now, we, we talked uh, a couple weeks ago about oh, a particular side story uh, that uh, Nintendo said there will be no expression which might be considered as gay conversion or drugging that occurs between characters. And um, they're talking about a side story where uh, one character marries the other after he drugs her with a perception-altering substance. So um, a lot of outlets said, uh, oh, they're ripping out that entire, uh, they're excising that entire side story. Maybe. I uh, don't know yet. But yeah, we haven't received confirmation on that. Right. They, they could just as easily just tweak the dialogue a little bit and leave the entire scene and relationship and thing there. Uh, we don't know yet. However, uh, last week, I think it was last week, maybe a week before last, yeah, uh, last uh, K- Kotaku got a confirmation from Nintendo that the petting minigame, which I'll describe in a sec, uh, got the axe. Uh, what happens in the Japanese version of the game is uh, you can invite people uh, to your private quarters for a chat. And um, it, depending on your relationship with these people, they, they say different things. And then on the bottom screen, it frames the person's face. And you can poke them in the face with the stylus. You can jab them in the eye or try and clean out their ears. <laughs> what you're supposed to do is stroke their cheek or their forehead or their hair or their clavicle or something. I don't know. Wherever they like to be stroked. And they'll go, ooh, ooh, oh, that feels so good. And the heart meter fills up <laughs> and your affinity with them increases. And you get stat bonuses because you're yeah, maximum nothing- affinity. Nothing makes me like a person better when they just touch my face for no reason. Yeah, this I, sounds I just like, love that. Yeah, you know? this totally <laughs> sounds like one of those really stupid getting to know you games. It, it, when you go into parties and they they, they try and do the trust fall. Uh-huh. This is kind of like the, okay, uh, Harold and Timmy go, go over here and stand next to each other. Now touch the face. Uh huh. Yeah, what? It, stop it. What? What? It, what are you even doing? No. <laughs> Stop! <laughs> but, um... So, uh, that's the Japanese version. So, uh, you invite them to your room, you have a quick chat, and then you rub them in their happy spot, which is somewhere on their face, and then your affinity <laughs> goes up, you get the stat bonuses for that, and you go on with your life. Yeah. Now, which I, and- I guess is, uh, um, you know, and then in Nintendo's uh, defense here, you know, they, they didn't go as far as, um, what was it, Dragon Crown, where you could caress the entire body of characters in that? Well, I mean, in Nintendogs, you can yeah. touch every inch of that dog. <laughs> every <Yeah>. inch. <laughs> uh, and there's, there's another one, Pokemon and Me, uh, yeah. where, where you can poke at the Pokemon and 
pet them. And th- there's also I Love My Horse and games of that series where you can pet yeah. the horses, all of it. So the whole stroking the... Inti- of course, there, there was a really old DS game, the name of which I don't remember, uh, where, where you rubbed people in different places. Oh, there, there, uh, there's a Doki Doki something witch-touching game where you have to jab yeah. the girls with the stylus <laughs> to find their yeah. witch mark or whatever. Uh, so yeah. it's not a completely I, I think new it's, mechanic, but... Yeah, it's not a new mechanic, but it's it's very different when you're... Thing. Yeah, but it's very witch. different mechanic when it's, you know, when compare, you know, comparing, uh, you know, petting an animal who's supposed to be your pet versus I, petting a, sh- a person that you're supposed to be... I think with. it's supposed yeah. to kind of mimic, you know, lovingly stroking someone's cheek, you know. Yeah, that but kind of a in thing. a lot of a lot of professions, that's considered s- uh, sexual harassment. Well, so. <laughs> in the context of the game, these are people. Uh, the, you're not like, uh, hey, employee number two, come to my room. No, no. These these are actual <laughs> people that you know and have uh, uh, developed an intimate relationship with. So, yeah. I, but I, when I, was the last time you gently stroked your best friend's face? Never, because it's <laughs> that's weird. <laughs> and that's the thing; it's just weird. Um, I have to, so it's out for the, uh, N64, N64, uh, the lo- location, uh, the, the, the localized version, but it, they didn't remove the entire, uh, Nintendo did not remove sequence, the entire, yeah. uh, private quarters thing. You still invite people back to your quarters. You still chat with them and their face is still on the bottom screen, uh, rendered in very nice 3d and animated very nice. You just can't poke them with the stylus. Uh, so you invite them to your room, you have a quick chat, they kind of stare at you, and then it fades out. And it feels like there's something, if you didn't know uh, what was supposed to be there, you would feel like there's something, that's it? There, there's something missing here. Yeah. Um, so uh, N- Nintendo took that out, and uh, most of the commentary I- I've read is, eh, I can live without it. Um I have to wonder, was this a, oh, th- this is inappropriate kind of removal, or was it, uh, this is just weird? <laughs> I, I think it was probably a, a decision that, you know, to, they, to remove this, because people in the U.S. don't consider this fun <laughs> in, in general, you know, not to stereotype, but, you know, you, the, uh, the United States population here, but... Mm. I, I don't get the feeling that this is the type of game the majority of Fire Emblem fans are going to want to play. You know, they they play Fire Emblem for the the strategy battles and the storyline, the character interactions. But I, this is just the kind of thing that people I, just you know, like romance in your ro- set, pairing off your crew and getting them to hook up and make kids with awesome stats is part of the fun of these games. Yeah. So I think there, there is kind of a dating sim light aspect of these games that uh, is important yeah. and fun and should be preserved. Um, me personally, I would have left it in. I, I, I would rather it be left in because it's so damn weird and goofy and that's a lot of what I like about video games. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's also something that's not really required. I mean, if you don't do that, you do miss out on some affinity boost, but that's not the only way you can get affinity. Uh, I, I'm not totally sure if there's no way to max out your infinity if you don't do that. But I, <laughs> I don't see that mini game because, again, it's just the face. It's not like you're poking people in the crotch. Uh, it's just the face. So I, I don't see it as being really offensive or even uncomfortable for any player. Just really weird. Yeah. It, it really weird, yes. Uh, and and that's, that's all I could really say because it just does not appeal to me. I have no interest whatsoever in playing a game and where I sh- gently stroke other play other characters faces well very small part Not of the even game, their bottom so. yeah you know it's just weird mechanic and and uh, I, you know, I don't even play these pet simulator games you know my <laughs> my kids like playing cats and dogs and 
stuff, but uh, but me, I just don't care. You know, I I don't even recall ever owning a Tamagotchi, so yeah, I, I just let him starve. Um, <laughs> but you know, it, it doesn't. It, it is a weird mechanic that I think probably most people in America would look at and go, "Why am what?" Do, especially since uh, when you go rubbing them all over the face, they they do make some pretty suggestive uh noises and moans it's it's like you're there with your stuff go what am i doing i feel dirty <laughs> i'm poking you in the nose of a stylus why are you why are you making those sounds it, so um but it, you know that really weird goofy crap is some of what I really like about games. Uh, yeah. even it totally doesn't work. I mean, that's one of the reasons I love the, the uh, Yakuza games. Because uh, mm -hmm. some of the side mini games in that, and again, it's stuff that you if you really have a problem with the, say, massage parlor uh, mini game in Yakuza, you can just stay the hell out of the massage parlor. You don't have to do it. But it's so damn weird that I personally <laughs> I love it because it's just uh, have, you, have you seen the massage parlor thing? No, I in, uh, haven't. Um, <clears throat> I, I don't know how consistent it is from game to game, but at least in Yakuza 4 you go into a massage parlor and there's a mini game where uh, you basically tap on the button to raise a, th a thermometer level in a uh, there's a meter on the side of the screen. You to raise the level, the, the ball in the center of the the graph. You tap on the button, and to let it go down, you release the button, and you try and keep it all the way at the top, but not too far because then you're finished with the massage. And if you let it go down all the way, are, are we picking up the subtle innuendo here? Yeah. <laughs> and if you let it go all the way down, you like fall asleep or something. Um, yeah, you you can't get it up. They're, they're very very uh, mature jokes here, and while you're doing it, the uh, d trying to keep the, uh, the 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 ball and the meter up towards the top in the background, the massage uh, parlor masseuse person is dancing around and uh, doing all kinds of soft wavy hand motion and suggestive movements, and then occasionally she'll just go Bleh! at the camera. <laughs> It is, it is so funny. I, I mean, it, it, this feel. It's that's what the whole face touching, petting thing came off as to me. Is this really weird, goofy, damn thing that um, I just don't really see many people. I can see people saying this is stupid. I'm not doing this. It's dumb. Mm -hmm. But uh, being that it's not a, a necessary part of the game, I don't think I would have left yeah. it in there. Um, and then uh, uh, intelligent systems, whoever the hell makes the game, uh, <clears throat> who is it? Uh, whoever it is, um, could say, "Well, that you, you know the face touching thing. We well, let's not do that next time because everyone thought that was just weird and stupid." So, <laughs> yeah. Anyway, uh, oh, uh, there's there's another thing that uh, Nintendo has done in uh, Bravely Default the second. Um, yeah, which well, I don't think it's a Nintendo because this is a Square Enix game, but is, it's it, it is coming out for Nintendo console. Yeah, but with 3DS. Is Nintendo publishing it in the in America or? Is... Um, I don't know. I'd have to look mm -hmm. that up. Anyway, so uh, in the original version, there is a from what I've heard is the Tomahawk class, which uh, the character wears traditional or stereotypical i really don't know enough about this stuff native american garb the uh kind of the 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 colorful cowhide looking uh loincloth type of thing and the face paint and the feathery mm. headgear thing i have no idea if that's actually accurate to any particular uh type of native american or if it's just kind of a amalgamation as of all of them as, watching movies i don't yeah, know as far as i know it's just it's it's sexy indian how it, it, it does to. look like uh yeah. spencer gifts sexy indian because the there's a lot of under boob showing in the uh bra top uh which sexy sure but it always looks like your bra you don't know how to buy a top I mean, I look at Quiet, and I'm like, from Metal Gear Solid Five. I'm like, you realize that top is like three sizes too small, right? You you, you should 
do you know what your size is? I mean, yeah. I, I, I know there isn't a Nordstrom's or Kmart or wherever the hell you shop out here in the Afghanistan desert, but you could do better <laughs> than that. You look like you don't know how to buy clothes that fit. Um, nice boobs, though. Uh, <laughs> where was it? Oh, so the tomahawk thing. So the, the tomahawk, uh, I don't know if it's inappropriate or offensive. I have I don't know enough about uh, Native American imagery or culture or dress to or anything about how this class actually operates. I mean, if the class actually goes ah la 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 and does a stupid rain dance type of thing, and Ow. maybe it's doing really weird uh, who made the red man red thing from the Peter Pan type of thing, <laughs> and it's like oh oh no. Oh, no. I don't know if it's doing anything like that. It may just be the costume. Anyway, it's not going to matter because that costume has been changed to the cowboy costume, which really all they did was they took off the face paint, took off the feathery thing, and put a cowboy hat on. And also well, made at a, the, the a better shot on Imager. It mm -hmm. looks like they did change oh, the pants. actual outfit because they, they put pants on it instead of the, um, the, uh, the painted belt thing that the uh, the tomahawk class has it's an actual it's like a looks like a an actual gun belt but it still has a lot of similar things like the little flappy things on the thighs those are yeah. still there mm -hmm. and and um, the upper arms yeah it's yeah, definitely an adaptation of the um uh the original uh, outfit but yeah. um i really d if there was something truly stereotypical or offensive about the original design or the way that character class worked, I'm okay with that being localized. Uh, but yeah. I don't know enough about either how that it was presented in the first place or enough about Native American stuff to really speak intelligently on it anyway. Uh, yeah. But I, I think changing it to cowboy is a nice compromise. On the other hand, it, it the whole gunslinger thing is kind of an unfair stereotype well stereotypes are unfair by definition but it the whole i shoot the hell out of you with my six shooters is kind of a stereotype of cowboys because cowboys are people who run cattle yeah. i know <laughs> i grew up in arizona i know cowboys my mom lives in kentucky i know cowboys i know people who run cowboy who run cattle they're cowboys none of them carry six shooters none of them <laughs> what are you gonna do with them shoot the cows <laughs> <laughs> oh well, uh, well, wild beast. What's going to come eat a cow? Well, <laughs> nothing wolves, eats the cow. Panthers. Not in no, Kentucky no. or Arizona. Well, there's there's uh, mountain lions. So. If it escapes from the zoo, <laughs> that's true. There, there are actually mountain lions in uh, in Arizona, but because uh, yeah. there's is, mountain lions in Oklahoma. Yeah, but there's, when you're, uh, like, coyotes I don't know. In I'm not I saying no one wolves, does, but, but I, there are I actually know some too. Right. I know yeah. some people who have uh, rifles and they they may actually like keep it on their horse when they're uh, driving the cattle from point A to point B. Well, yeah, but I have never heard of anyone having to shoot anything while moving cattle. <laughs> in this day and age. Like, oh shit, they're after my cattle, man. <laughs> so I, I mean, you have to wonder if the uh, yeah. Native American uh, or Tomahawk class to cowboy classes swapping one stereotype for another. Um, well, on the other I hand, it's, I, a, I would, it's a more acceptable uh, character uh, uh, caricature. Of, well, you know, certainly, because a, a cowboy yeah. cowboy is an occupation, not a ethnicity or yeah. re really a, and, a group and of people. Nobody's going to complain, history. right? Yeah, and nobody's going to complain when you have a gunslinger in your video game, because a gunslinger is a very popular character in movies, books, and video games. Uh, well, not so much video games, because there, there are surprisingly too few cowboy video games. I'm serious. Yeah, there, there, needs to be more, there needs to be more games based in the Wild West. Yeah. I'm sorry. People. I actually have Red Dead Redemption sitting on my shelf. I'm excited to, at some point... Yeah, that. I, I that that's a game that uh, I I keep wanting to play and never getting around to it. And then then there's a, a gun, and uh, and Red Steel, which is kind of a a it, it's a different take on a on a on uh, well, the cowboy. Genre. Yeah, Red Steel Two kind of has some cowboyish influence mixed with a uh, uh, you know samurai kind of the, yeah. the Western look at samurai anyway. Um, so. What I would have preferred in this case, however, is um, 
rather than changing the uh, Tomahawk class to Cowboy, I would have preferred they actually identify what actually the problem was and fix that. I, I yeah, mean, if, if there were some the adjustments to the minor class that they could have made uh, yeah. without it being offensive, I, I would have gone that direction. I, I think the 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 problem is is they just kind of they they went the uh, the easy route. They they right. basically looked at uh, a Spencer's halloween catalog and said okay that's the outfit we want for our native american character you know instead what they could have done and what they should have done is open up a history book and pick a tribe a native american tribe look at what their warriors wore and make an outfit based on that yeah because i don't want the lesson to be you can't have native americans in video games not appropriate it's offensive that's not what anyone should take away from this no not at all we should have native americans in video games that's awesome just do it right <laughs> so yeah. um someone uh let's let's see uh, do, 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 do. Uh, uh someone said so oh um uh, Laxter recommended for the um, the the pokey people in the face thing in Fire Emblem. Uh, Laxter says just take out the noises. That actually is a pretty good idea. I think you in the the uh, localized version of Fire Emblem Fates uh, sadly does not include the Japanese voice track. It's only the English track. Just change the uh, the, the the vocal reactions to being poked in the face. Yeah, because you know, because they're very suggestive. Yeah, like, what are you doing? Yeah. Stop touching like, me! Stop it! <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, that's so sweet. Uh, I I think create. I I think the way the uh, localized uh, dialogue was recorded could have um, uh, smoothed over any uh, of the more potentially uncomfortable, if even, uh, aspects of that little mini game. Yeah. It's like uh, I'm like poking you in the eyeball why are you making such suggestive sounds that's weird. <laughs> so um that's actually seven o'clock but uh let's see uh do, 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 do. all right one more uh so here's an interesting thing from the week uh the fine brothers who have more subscribers than i do uh known uh for a lot of different videos but a very popular series of uh reaction videos uh, kids react to usually like old tech older technology like walkmans and stuff uh elders react usually to modern technology and uh things like that um the fine brothers uh wanted to um uh trademark react now uh they actually unbeknownst to most everyone already got the trademarks for elders react kids react something else react uh and we're getting the uh, trademark for react and wanted to create a react world program where they license out their um uh format and graphics to other people who wanted to make reaction videos this went over like a lead bl balloon and <laughs> I have to say that was incredibly tone deaf on the Fine Brothers part, especially hot on the heels of the Sony Let's Play trademark fiasco. Um, yeah, but you can't really uh, um, fault them for that because they probably don't follow the video game industry as carefully as some of us. Yeah, you know? as far as I know, they are not they are not a strictly video game oriented. They have a lot of reactions uh, channel, to so. video games, though. So, uh, may, I mean, maybe yeah. they didn't know that, but um, that, yeah. Uh, I, I guess if your your ear is not to the ground in that area, you, you wouldn't know. But uh, no one liked that because it came off as if you want to do a reaction video, and my most popular vi video by far is a reaction video um <laughs> you have to pay us is what it can now that may not be they, they claim that's not what they had intended and no, i'm giving them the benefit of the doubt on that but credit where credit's due uh the fine brothers walked back on that within a week the fine brothers uh did something that a lot of triple a publishers could probably learn from and that's realize they were doing something that everybody hated 
so they stopped doing it. Uh, they rescinded all of their React trademarks, said we're so said they're sorry, and said, all right, we're not doing that. Uh, Laxter and several other people on my Twitter uh, have asked if the Fine Brothers copyright striked my mom reacts to uh, me masturbating video, which is which just crossed 600,000 views. Um, no, they didn't. No, yeah. they didn't. I, I know well, you're they all can't just copyright making... strike it anyways. Well, you know, this right. is a trademark issue. Right. And, right. But I, and I know you're all being silly, but again, credit where credit's due. The Fine Brothers did walk back on the whole React trademark thing. Yeah. So no, now, I have not heard from the Fine Brothers. Yeah, but I, but I want to I want to point out something. It, it, the The idea behind what they wanted to do was actually you know, I I'm of the opinion that it was actually a cool thing that they were trying to do. Could be yes. Um and. It could be, yeah. And, and Tech Dirt wrote a really good article about how this could be a really good idea if they had presented it in a way that actually appealed to the public. Um, the problem that they had, according to Mike Nas Masnick at uh, Tech Dirt, was that they come from a very Hollywood background and they used very Hollywood language in their video, and and. Hollywood has a way of talking about IP that just grates against the minds of the vast majority of the of the public. And so using that Hollywood language in this video was what caused the problem. Had they actually changed the the dialogue, had they they run the di their their script past some normal people before actually making the video, it probably would have come across better because the idea was they were going to help you brand, distribute, and promote your videos for a modest fee uh, or a modest share of the, the ad yeah. revenue. And that's the that was the whole idea behind it. Yeah, it's like, not, we will let you brand with without paying yeah. us, right. Yeah, they were like, if you want to make a React video and you want to reach our network of YouTube viewers, then we will help you do that by providing logos and and templates and and then promotional support. You know, that's a really cool idea. You know, get you know if you want, you could make a video and get a really big channel to promote your video. That's a really good deal for you as the the video creator, but because they used Hollywood language that doesn't jive with the rest of us, it came across as as uh, way worse than what it really should have been. So hopefully they learned that lesson. <laughs> Um, yeah. And no, Super Podcast Action Committee is not a trademark. We have not gone that route yet. So I, I think if it became valuable enough, we might. But, uh, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, if, I, I'm not aware of any other any other podcast or anything like that trying to use that. That's to, true. That name. Uh, I mean, so. if we were actually making a living doing this show, I think we'd probably look into uh, securing the branding for the show, but uh, nope. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I, 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 I mean, I think have, if it got to that point, we might even consider changing the name or something to be a little more um, mass, uh, you know, have more mass appeal. Yeah, I think it, I think it's a actually, clever, funny name, but I I don't think it grabs. I think you're right. I I don't think it has a very wide appeal. I don't think yeah. average Joe here in Super Podcast Day, eh, whatever. It's too long. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but that's okay. I I do yeah. like the name. Uh, so oh, that is our you. show for tonight. Uh, I have to do more uh, Lego not Star Wars, Lego um, Marvel's Avengers. And uh, I was talking a bit about guide writing last week, and I, uh, one thing you might be wondering is how long does it actually take to write a video game guide? Um, depends very heavily on the type of game, but yes. uh, I find that uh, a pretty decent estimate of how long the entire project is going to be is... Um, the number of hours it would take to 100% the game 
multiply that by 2.5. That's about <laughs> how long the entire project is going to take you. Yeah, because so, you, you've got playing the game, you've got recording footage, you've got taking notes, and then you've got compiling all that, all those notes into a readable and usable guide and editing and uploading footage of the game. So... So if uh, Lego Star, why do I keep calling it that? If Lego Marvel Avengers takes me 40 hours to 100%, then we're looking at about 60 hours of actually writing the guide, scrubbing the footage for screenshots, formatting everything, uh, uploading screenshots, embedding them where they're supposed to be, all that kind of stuff, uh, for a grand total of about 100 hours total for the project. Uh, which I'm also, which I'm doing in my spare time, because I already do a 40-hour work week. Plus, uh, I'm on the off-hours rotation, so I'm on call a lot. Plus, game politics. Plus, you know, eating, <laughs> going to the gym, <laughs> uh, things like that. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, Laxer says, so it takes uh, 1.5 times game time to write it. Yeah, about that. So, if it, so a if a chapter of the game takes me an hour to play through and uh, find all the various doohickeys in, uh, what I do is I record the footage and then I uh, 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 load it into my video editor and I scrub through the footage and write the guide. Uh, based partially on memory and also as I'm scrubbing through the footage so I can get landmarks and make sure I'm not forgetting things. And also it yeah. gives me a chance to actually pick out the screenshots <clears throat> and place them in the guide as I write. So it takes about... So it takes... To, to write the actual page that covers the chapter I just played takes a bit longer than actually playing the chapter. Um, yeah. Typically. So... And then you've got uh, you know a game like a Lego game where you play through the chapter in story mode and then you come back <clears throat> yeah, in free yeah. play there so are, that you can actually get everything. Yeah, there so. are 15 chapters in Lego Marvel's Avengers. Um, it takes about 40 minutes or so uh, to complete a chapter in story mode. And then it takes another 30 minutes to 40 minutes to go back through in free play and uh, find everything else. Then you have um, uh, seven hub areas, each of which takes about 45 minutes to find everything in. And then you have the entire island of Manhattan, which has... Um, <laughs> Uh, let me see what the totals on this thing are. Uh, 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 oh, God. Uh, do, 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 do. 140 gold bricks, 26 vehicle tokens, 41 um, character tokens, and 13 Stan Leaves in peril. Um, I've divided <laughs> up Manhattan <laughs> into eight separate areas, <clears throat> including the helicarrier that uh, floats above Manhattan, Lower East Side, Lower West Side, Upper West Side, Upper East Side, Central Park, um, Harlem, and uh, Washington Heights. And uh, so each one of those is a page. So that's, uh, yeah, that, that's a lot of work. Plus I, have to, plus I have a character page which lists all the characters in the game, how much they cost, and where they're found. Mm -hmm. I, have a, I have a page, of same thing for the vehicles. Uh, same thing with all the other collectibles. Uh, red bricks, the, the cheats are on their own page. Um, so, yeah. It's, um, it's a time-consuming project. So, um, anyone looking to... Uh, so, I am absolutely amazed at the people who just do this for fun on Game Facts. I get paid to do this. So, <laughs> you know, but I see some of the guides that people write on Game Facts. I'm like... Do you have nothing to do? <laughs> I mean, wow! <laughs> just writing in your that's a, that that amazes me. But then again, I, I guess I spend a lot of time working on YouTube videos. Uh, not right now because one's claimed, and uh, I'm busy with freelance work. So it's like you put a lot of work in these YouTube videos. Why? It's like, oh, well, because other people enjoy them. 
And so yeah. I imagine it's the same thing with game facts guides. Anyway, uh, so let us. Uh, I appreciate plug- the people who write game facts guides because I use them a lot. <laughs> yeah, so. uh, actually. Uh, I do uh, look at other while I'm playing the game. I, I do I will consult other sources, um, uh, just so I can get information into the guide in a timely manner. Um, because some people, like younger kids who don't work eight hours a day, can play through the entire game in the first two or three days because they're not also writing a guide at the same time. So. I will, uh, like the Red Brick page, I'll construct based off of Let's Play videos. I'll look and see where the Red Bricks are, describe it in text, and just so we can have that page up in the guide because that's one of the um, that's one of the uh, more popular pages that people are going to be looking at. Uh, same thing with cheat codes. I, I Google for cheat codes, and I find them, and I verify them, and I put them in the guide. I didn't find all those cheat codes myself. <laughs> so I actually, I, I got three of them just by taking a, uh, a Lego survey. If you look in the instruction booklet, it says, go here to take a survey and get cheat codes. And the survey is, how did you like the game? I said, I don't know. I'm just here for the cheat codes. <laughs> I haven't played it yet. Um, anyway, so uh, for the third time, let us close the show. Uh, Andrew <laughs> Eisen here, E-I-S-E-N is the last name. Go to YouTube, plug it in, and you'll find all my videos except... Captain Toad headbutts Toadette in the crotch because Nintendo's copyright claimed it and is not letting go. Um, uh, hopefully after I finish, I have some... I wanted to do a birthday video. Busy. I wanted to do a Valentine's Day video. Busy. Uh, hopefully I'll have some new videos other than Super Pack uh, <coughs> up sometime. Uh, Twitter, <laughs> at Andrew Eisen. Facebook, Andrew Eisen YouTube. So uh, there's all my stuff. Knock yourself out. Uh, e Zachary Knight, plug away. All right, you can follow me on Twitter at Easy Knight, and you can follow my game development work. It's DK underscore gaming on Twitter, and it's DivineNightGaming.com. And uh, I am working on a video game right now. I even posted a screenshot earlier today. Um, uh, hopefully, I'll have more coming along over the next couple of weeks as uh, my schedule clears up a little bit, but. Uh, that, that'll be exciting, and if you're interested in the Oklahoma game development scene, you can follow OK Game Devs on Twitter and OKGameDev.com. And for uh, other interesting points, uh, other interesting stories about the video game industry, you can follow RandomTower.com when I do write stuff there, and RustyOutlook.com for something a little less serious when I get around to writing stuff there. So check those places out, and hopefully the more people who see, go to those sites, the more often I'll write content. So there you go. There you are. All right, you've been listening to Super Pack Podcast or Super Podcast Action Committee, episode 176. Uh, we stream live every Saturday night at 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time on GamePolitics.com. Hope to see you again next week. In the meantime, send us email at superpackpodcast at gmail.com. Follow us on Twitter at superpackpodcast. Subscribe and rate us on iTunes. And yes, I did fix the show order. Uh, we accidentally put in <laughs> show 174 as 175 last week. Oops. 174 and 75 are are there in their proper spots now and uh, like us on facebook so we are done here see you next week bye-bye all right see ya